Good morning, folks. Uh, sorry, we uh, having a little technical glitch this morning, so that's why we didn't have the countdown. So we're ready to worship, so who needs a countdown? We're here to worship God, so please settle back as we offer you this uh, offering from the Reese family. <laughs> it's a rock. Let's rock, Mariana. week three of our worship series, My God is a Rock, from Worship Design Studio. Don't forget that you can build your own rock cairn in Solenke Commons. Label it with your name on a piece of note paper that is provided. We have a few announcements this morning. This Thursday is the deadline to submit your graduates' information to the church office. Graduates will be honored in worship on July 11th. There is a search committee meeting this Saturday, June 26th at 10 a.m. via Zoom. Mark your calendar to join us after worship on July 4th for our ice cream social in Cartwright Hall. If you'd like to donate some toppings for the ice cream, please get with Mariana. We have plenty of syrups, but thank you for donating anything other than that. <laughs> right now, Someone special has a few more announcements. 
Oh, it's here. Well, it's Father's Day. This is not the call to worship, but I think that because it's Father's Day, I want to test you a little bit because, you know, we all have fathers of some kind or another, right? So, and, you know, the famous dad jokes, well, I found some that are from the Bible. So I want to see if anybody can answer any of these. Um, do you know what was the first tennis match in the Bible? No. Joseph served in Pharaoh's court. <laughs> it's a dad joke. All right. How about the greatest comedian in the Bible? Samson, he brought the house down. And what time of day was Adam created? A little before Eve. One more. Did Eve ever have a date with Adam? No, just an apple. Okay. I thought we ought to honor Dad somehow today, and the sermon doesn't exactly go there, so we did this instead. I hope you found one you can tell when you get home to somebody else, okay? But we do honor the dads among us, and we know how important that role is in our lives, and so we're grateful for all of you and for some of the sons and daughters who have come with family today to uh, honor Mom and Dad, and Dad, especially Dad. So let us come together at this time and do together our litany for our call to worship. Are you weary, worn out, tired? Do you feel frail, weak, and uncertain of your future? Are you trusting in your own strength? Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. Let's continue with that good music as we stand and sing our opening song. God of light and love, hear us when we cry aloud. Remind us that we have nothing to fear. We give thanks that you are the God of light, and that you wrap us in comforting arms and lift us from the darkness of our guilt and sin. You forgive us once and for all. Open our hearts to receive your message of comfort, peace, and security. 
that we may find rest in your loving, protective presence. Open our spirits to follow the path you put before us, that we may lead lives committed to your way. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> So, for the children's moment today, I do have something for our fathers, but Diane didn't know that. Um, Proverbs chapter 4, verse 1 is a Bible verse that says, Listen, my sons, to a father's instruction. Pay attention and gain understanding. So, how many of you listen to the wise thing that your father says to you? I heard that, Bryn Mawr. After all, your father is older, has far more experience, and is much wiser than you are. To prove my point, I have made a list of the top ten sayings of a wise father. I am sure that you have heard many of these wise sayings from the lips of your very own father. Let's see number ten. Why? Because I said so. That's why. Number nine. Just wait till you have kids of your own. Number eight. What did I just finish telling you? Number seven. This is going to hurt me more than it does you. I won't ask who's heard that one. <laughs> Number six. Do I look like I'm made out of money? Number five. Not now. I'm watching the game. Number four, I like this one. When you break your leg, don't come running to me. Okay, good, you got it. <laughs> Number three, no, we are not lost. <laughs> Number two, be quiet. Can't you see I'm trying to think? <laughs> and number one on the list of the top ten sayings of a wise father is, how should I know, ask your mother. Well, maybe your father doesn't always have all the right answers, but God has blessed most of you with a godly father, and he has commanded you to show him honor and respect. You should always remember to pray for your father and ask God to give him the wisdom he needs to train you in the way that God wants you to grow. I think it would also be a good thing to give a word of thanks to your fathers. Thank him for providing for your physical needs, the house you live in, the food you eat, and the clothes you wear. Thank him for the wisdom he shares, even though he may not always have all the answers. <clears throat> and finally, thank him for living a godly life and setting a good example for you to follow. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you for our fathers, and we pray that you will bless them with the wisdom needed to be good fathers. Amen. So as our band comes up and gets ready and our special singers get gathered again, uh, we have a, a little special song for our fathers today. Um, I don't know about you, but, um, you know, even after par parents have grown and, you know, into their golden years, sometimes they may still be filled with doubts about the job they did in raising their children. Um, I recently went through something similar with my mom a couple weeks ago. She was having some doubts. And I just reassured her that, you know, she followed God's leading, and that's all that we as children could ask of her. And so, fathers, today we offer to you the song, Lead Me, which is sung from a father's perspective, who's asking God to lead him as he tries to lead his family.
I feel like we already prayed, don't you? Let's continue in prayer. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father of all creation, we bow our heads in honor and in thanksgiving for your love and care for our lives. You show us what life and goodness can mean and guide us towards a fuller way of living. You know better than anyone, even better than ourselves, that human life is fraught with complexity. You see the good in us that you created in us, but you also see the lesser ways we sometimes choose to live. All of us, all parts of us, are loved by you. May we listen to your still, small voice as we learn to follow you even more. We thank you for dads today, God, for dads who can change a diaper and teach us how to drive, who are strong enough to join a tea party and yet show us how to hit a home run, for dads wise enough to know when to say the right thing and also who stay silent to allow us to come to a better decision. Bring your peace to those who suffer, Lord, because of fathering that hurt us more than helped. We pray as we enter this weekend that has seen a, a new holiday forming, Juneteenth, for it's been a day of celebration for many, 
for many years. And yet now we all join that in the hope that racism will end, that we will be able to see that the parts of us that still hold on to that are some of those lesser parts that you are guiding us out of. Hear our prayers this morning, Lord, for we abide in your spirit and we feel the shelter of your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our scripture this morning comes from Psalm 27, chapter 1, verse 4 through 5 and 13 through 14. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? One thing I ask the Lord that will I seek after to live in the house of the Lord all of the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inspire, inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will set me high on a rock. I believe that I shall see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Well, sometimes when I read scripture, maybe you do this too, sometimes a, a word or a phrase will kind of jump out at me. And I don't know, if you want to take just a minute, I, I know you can listen and look at your scripture in the bulletin. And see if there's some word or phrase that jumps out at you from what you read this morning. It can often be a guide to our spirit, to what we're hungry for to hear a word from God. Or what we need to know. Maybe it's a leading from God to say, hey, pay attention to this. Well, one of those phrases jumped out at me in the scripture that we have from today. And it jumped off the page and it stayed embedded in my thoughts all week. It's this. Day of trouble. Day of trouble. It had this kind of effect on me as I prepared the sermon. What's a day of trouble that's bad enough that God needs to hide us to shelter us from its effects in our lives? So I did some research on that phrase, and I found some interesting things. Do you know that that phrase, the day of trouble, is used in 26 verses of the Bible? and all of them are in the Old Testament. It's a way of naming times that we have a great difficulty to overcome, and it's both a lament, oh my God, I don't know how I'm going to get through this situation, but it's also a praise because often in those scriptures, God keeps us safe in the midst of what seems like something that I alone can never overcome. King David was writing this psalm in just one of those times of his life. He's thought to be the writer of this psalm, and he's experiencing the death of his favorite son. He had three sons, and Absalom was the third, the youngest. He was also a very handsome young man, and he was David's favorite. Well, as favorite spoiled children often do, he decided that at one point in his adult life, he thought he could run the kingdom better than his dad, David. And so he took an army, he gathered up an army, he was, he was very charismatic, and so he got people to come with him, and they had a battle against his own father. And Absalom is on his horse, and he's riding into battle, and he had this long, beautiful hair, and it got caught in a branch of a tree, and he was killed. He died. Well, the battle ended, of course, and David remained king. Well, David wanted to remain king, and for that he was happy or glad, but he grieved so terribly and lamented the death of his son, Absalom, maybe even the death of that part of their relationship that made Absalom fight against him. 
How did David come to understand God at work in this seemingly unworkable situation? He said this, you remember in the scripture, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Here he is in the midst of this worst thing that could happen, the loss of his son. The Lord is the stronghold of my life. He will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under cover of his tent. I believe that I shall see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living while I'm alive. Wait for the Lord. Be strong. Let your heart take courage. And so day of trouble becomes a theme of scripture, the day of trouble and how God acts in it. Sometimes God is the solo actor in being our refuge and our shelter. But you know, sometimes God needs an army, as in the story of David and Absalom. But we know this, that we can rely on our God to give us refuge in our days of trouble. And God knows we have had them, and God knows we will have them. But today, I bring you a a video, a story of a friend of mine and the congregation she serves in Tacoma, Washington, one of our sister congregations, First Christian Church in Tacoma, Washington. And they are being that refuge, that shelter for a population of people that I want to share with you how they have done that. I think I mentioned that I vacationed with those two seminary friends, Renee Jensen, we saw in a picture one other week, and Barbara Blaisdell is the other one. She's the youngest of us, and so she just retired. Renee and I both retired a while, or at least I keep trying to retire. Uh, but Barbara just retired a couple weeks ago and moved from Tacoma, Washington, 3,000 miles to Boston, Massachusetts, where her two daughters and her all three of her grandchildren live. So I've followed uh, parts of, or all of Barbara's ministry over these years and am so very moved by the things she's been able to accomplish, she and the congregations that she served. But I've been watching with great interest as she and this congregation in Tacoma found a way to bring God's refuge to a population that was surely facing their own day of trouble. And I'm referring to the homeless population. And I could tell you about it, but I finagle Barbara to do a little interview. Uh, and so she made a video for us. And I want to let her tell you about this ministry because I think maybe we could get some ideas about things that, you know, we think sometimes that we are too small to do anything significant. Well, this church is comparable to the church that I'm going to show you on this video. So watch it and see what you think. Greetings, Muncie disciples. My name is Barbara Blaisdell, and I'm coming to you from my new study in Paxton, Massachusetts. But until June 1st of this year, I was the senior pastor of First Christian Church of Tacoma. Your interim pastor, Diane Zare, has asked me to talk about some of the work we've done there in the last couple of years to address the rise of homelessness in our city and in our neighborhood. First, a bit of context. The church sits on six beautiful acres and is located in northwest Tacoma, a neighborhood bordered by the Puget Sound on two sides. It's surrounded by lovely homes and then some commercial properties. Even so, over the past several years, we've experienced a sharp rise in homelessness in the neighborhood, in the city, and on our church campus. A word about climate and the style of our campus will help set the stage for our story. Tacoma is just south of Seattle and shares that city's relatively mild winters with lots and lots of rain. So the church campus consists of four separate buildings surrounding an open air courtyard with deep covered walkways so that we can get from, for example, the education wing to the sanctuary without getting wet when it's raining. 
Those covered walkways, it turns out, provide shelter from wind and rain if you've nowhere else to go. More and more often in the past couple of years, we've been arriving to the church campus to come to work, finding people sleeping on those walkways underneath those shelters. Until 2019, most of the folks we saw were men who were for the most part polite, respectful, and left quietly when we needed them to. But sometime about two years ago, something changed. We began to arrive at campus to find women included in that population. And then one day in late uh, 2019, I arrived to find a young woman with her two toddlers sleeping there in our courtyard. As I spoke with her, it became clear that she had escaped a violent household, and that's why she was out there with those babies. And the terrifying thing for me as her pastor, um, as the pastor in that situation is, there was no way for me to guarantee that she and the children would be protected on that open air campus. And so we began looking for help in finding ways to help. We knew enough uh, about the complexity of the problem to know we, we were not uh, qualified to simply open a shelter or uh, nor did we have the money to provide uh, hotel housing or anything like that um, for the numbers of people uh, we had on campus. And so my the chair of our trustee, the moderator, and I spent probably over a year going to every ecumenical gathering or government and social agency we could find to try to discover what help we might get in being able to help. In early 2000, we found a partner in the Low Income Housing Institute, a wonderful um, ecumenical faith-based organization that has a good track record in the Seattle-Tacoma area, building both shelters and tiny house communities, tiny home communities. They were able to partner with us to get government funding, city support, for a tiny house community on a small portion of our six acres of land. We worked with Lehigh and their partners to build 42 tiny homes for families, including families with children. This is a gated community to protect those who were homeless due to domestic violence. There's a full-time a full manager and a full-time social worker. Services include uh, employment counseling. We have ecumenical partners in the city who bring lunch to the campus every single day. And the food bank comes um, both to provide food for humans and to provide pet food for the animals who live in the village. The village has a community garden um, uh, and then has access to our wooded area and our parking lot uh, to provide uh, space, recreational space for children and families. We opened in December of 2020. And so in the last just over six months, we have gotten 91 families and children off the streets of Tacoma and into tiny homes. Um, four families were able to be reunited with their children when the children had been taken away by family services because they were homeless. Two new babies are expected in the village in the next couple of months. 17 of those 91 people have been permanently rehoused uh, in new settings. Uh, the, the local VA group raised money to provide barbecues this summer so that folks can cook out 
um, if uh, as a break from using the common kitchen that is there. Uh, we're just really excited about this ministry. Uh, 14 children currently reside on the campus and one of the things the church is doing is providing free music and art lessons to any child who uh, des desires that with parental permission um, and observation for safety, of course. So we're very excited about what we were able to do. We didn't try to do it alone. We found smart, savvy partners to help, but we really feel like we are making um, a difference and even those in the neighborhood who initially were resistant to the tiny house community seem to see that it has really been an addition to our neighborhood. Neighborhood businesses have been hiring members of the community to staff their own uh, businesses. And so we're very pleased with that. I hope this is what you needed. I hope you find it helpful. God bless you as you discern the ways God is calling you to serve your community. Well, I have to say, Barbara, if you're watching now or if you're watching in the future, we do so appreciate your taking that time to uh, tell us about that ministry. Well, she said, she was telling me as we talked on the phone afterwards that those tiny homes, 42 of them, was it too echoey? I hope you were able to hear, uh, you could hear what was going on. But uh, there are 42 homes on their six-acre campus, but it only takes up a small portion. And they have a, a social workers, case workers, and they're really making a difference in the lives of the homeless population in their community. And so she said, uh, since she's left, they've added small decks to each of the tiny homes. I also found out that they're heated, uh, they have electric heat in them. And uh, I said, well, what about air conditioning? And she said, in that area, it doesn't really get as warm where they need it very often in Tacoma. So they don't need it uh, as much there. I don't know about you, but I've often passed a homeless person on the street, and sometimes I say hi or strike up a conversation with them, but often I just feel helpless. I, I don't know what to do, anything meaningful to help. But watching this video and seeing what this congregation has done over the past years gives me hope that there really are significant and meaningful and effective ways that the church can be that army that provides a refuge to a world that God needs us to do. You know, there are some facts about homelessness that I found out. There are half a million homeless people in the United States. And half of that half a million are African Americans. Some are veterans. Some are mothers and children fleeing violent situations. Many are addicted to some substance or another, and so they have multiple layers of issues to deal with. But all of these things lead them into these situations of needing to find some kind of refuge and shelter. God calls us to say, come with me, let's do this. Let's be that shelter. Those words we remember, God will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. The scriptures also remind us to be a part of building that shelter when it says, do not forget to entertain strangers, for by doing so without knowing it, some people have entertained angels unawares. And of course, Jesus in Matthew 25 reminds us, I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. Naked and you gave me clothing. Sick and you took care of me. In prison and you visited me. You and I live in the shelter of the Lord. 
And it's a pretty good shelter that life has, we and life have created and God has offered us. But sometimes God looks around and says, there are other folks out there that are still searching for home, searching for that kind of covering, that kind of refuge from the day of trouble in their lives. May we be strong for God, a cover for those who are in drastic, overwhelming situations. For indeed, God goes before us. God will come after us, but God wants to walk with us. Let's go. Will you pray with me? God, we hear these stories of wonderful things being done in your name, and we just sometimes doubt that we really can have that kind of impact in any way in our world, and yet you call us. You call us to look around and to dream and to have the vision to step out in courage, to wait for you and then follow you. May we do that even as Jesus called the disciples and said, follow me, may we follow you. In his name we pray, amen. We come to a time of response when you have a moment to just kind of let these thoughts sink into your heart and spirit and mind and maybe see if God is speaking to you today in some way. So as we respond to the word of God from today, let us stand as we sing together.
Well, there was a little girl who went up to the preacher and said, you know, when I grow up, I'm going to make a lot of money, and I'm going to give you some. And the preacher said, well, why do you say that? And she said, because my dad says you're one of the poorest preachers we've ever had. <laughs> All right, that's the last dad joke. Well, preachers at Hazelwood aren't poor, okay? Let me put it that way. And partly that's because of your generosity in how you offer your gifts to God, both the gifts of your time and yourselves and also your financial offerings that you give. So we receive all of those with thanksgiving in this time. God receives them, for we give them out of grateful and generous hearts. And so if you can put them in the offering plate at back or give online. We know that they'll get where they need to go and you won't have a poor preacher, at least that way. We'll hope the other way too. And so we come to this time of communion when we gather around this table. Let us sing our song of communion as we prepare for that time. We come around this table to come home, come home to our Lord. For that is the gift Jesus sought to give, that we would remember who we are in him and that we would remember whose we are in the love of God. And so all are invited to partake of this gift of communion, for it is something that no one God would bar from or Jesus would bar from. And so we take the bread, even as he did with his disciples. He broke it and passed it among his disciples and said, This bread is my body, which is broken for you. Each time you eat of it, do this in remembrance of me. And then likewise, after supper, he took the cup also and passed it among his disciples and said, This cup is the new covenant of my blood poured out for you, for the forgiveness of your sin each time you drink of it. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Our dear Lord, we give you thanks, wonderful God, and sing praises in you 
because in you we find strength and support in all of life's troubles. We gather here to remember that even when Jesus faced his own death on the cross, he gathered his disciples together in the upper room to feed them and to bring them strength. Thus, when we gather here, we too find nurture and strength in your steadfast love. The bread and wine that we share here help us recall that Christ gave up everything so that we might have life. Bless us with your spirit as we eat and drink so that your love may draw us together. Now, Lord, we come to you with the prayer that your precious Son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the glory and the power forever. Amen. Let us partake. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day, for these people who have come together to worship you. We know that you are here with us. We know that you provide shelter and strength all the days of our lives. We don't ask that you remove all the worries of life. We ask that you help us to turn them over to you. Lord, please accept these offerings given today. May they be put to the good works you have planned. Be with each of us this week, Lord. Help us to spread your word to others. May thy will be done as we keep our faith and our trust in you. Amen. Let us stand as we sing together our closing song. know the refuge of our Lord in your day of trouble, and may as a church you seek to be that shelter, that refuge for others. Go now, have courage, be strong, and wait upon the Lord. And the congregation said, <laughs>